How's it going, Yankee fans? Welcome back to Fireside Yankees with your boys, Alex and Ryan. So today we have an interesting topic for you regarding the infield third base position. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the Yankees are interested in Matt Chapman. Now, let's preface this by saying there are no corroborating stories of this. You know, there's one report saying they're interested. We don't know if it's factual, but interesting conversation nonetheless to have. I talked about it this morning in an article. Ryan, you wrote about it. We actually may have conflicting views here. Um, I know you kind of suggested on Twitter that you wouldn't be mad about acquiring Matt Chapman. And look, he's an elite defensive player. He is sick defensively. Offensively, he's never been below 100 WRC+. plus. So traditionally speaking, he's been slightly above average as a hitter in his career. Um, but with that being said, last year, started off red hot and was terrible down the stretch. Just he was basically unplayable offensively at times um, later down that later down that stretch of the season. But he has the capacity to be a very, very good hitter and, you know, has hit 27 homers in his career. He's got power. Um, how does he fit into this infield prospectively? But, Ryan, before we dive into it, how do you do today, my friend? I'm doing great. And as you alluded to, Matt Chapman was brutal down the stretch. And I want to preface this by saying... I don't want to give Matt Chapman a nine-figure contract. We talked about this with Blake Snell, where it's like, look, not like bringing in Juan Soto and hoping to extend him or sign him in next year's free agency means not signing players like Blake Snell and not signing players like Jordan Montgomery. And Matt Chapman is included in the players you can't sign if you're trying to sign Juan Soto because you need to be able to, to develop talent internally or find surplus value on the market. Now, Jeff Passan floated the idea that some of the Boris clients could be a short-term deal. And, and this is why I believe that the report, and this isn't to demean the San Francisco Chronicle, I'm just saying I think maybe the interest was earlier in the offseason and more exploratory than like legitimate true interest, like the way that the Yankees had even interest in Blake Snell, where the Yankees were willing to make a $150 million offer. I don't think they're willing to make a $100 million offer on Matt Chapman, and I believe that that's the right call because I do believe there's a lot of volatility in his profile. I don't think anchoring a six-year deal to him is the wisest move in the world, especially considering the plethora of infield talent you have in your system. At that point, just pay Glaber Torres. Like, I'm not even sure Glaber is a significantly better player than Matt Chapman, but he might come at a lower cost, and he's significantly younger, and he's a little more consistent with the bat. So, um, you know, he's one of your guys. So there's also that added uh, th that added portion of, like, this is a guy who's familiar in your organization, and he might have a big year next year. Who knows? But getting back to Matt Chapman here, Obviously, the fit would be defensively, like he is one of the best defensive third basemen in all of baseball. He's been a war machine. He's put up 4.4 war this past year, 3.5 the year prior, 3.5 in 2021. Um, you know, career 31.2 war, according to baseball reference, uh, in his major league career. And look, when you're in your age 31 season and you have 30 plus war, not that you're on a Hall of Fame pace, but you're going to end up in the Hall of Very Good. Um, and I do believe players are oftentimes, uh, you know, undervalued if their defense first or if they're if the majority of their value at least half of their value comes from their glove um and i think he's going to be a good fit elsewhere but as you alluded to there is a very good argument to make that that money could go better elsewhere and there's a very good argument to make that that money would hinder the yankees from doing things that they might need more right let's say you know the Angels are out of it, and the Angels are horrible. Let's let's just be completely honest here. The Angels are horrible, right? You could have a guy like Brandon Drury become available to play third base for you. That's a half a year commitment. That's not a big prospect cost. You can get him at the deadline. You can evaluate your options. You get an opportunity to evaluate DJ LeMahieu. Is it completely fair to jettison DJ LeMahieu from the starting lineup for Matt Chapman when you're already paying LeMahieu and you don't know what he's going to be next year? Look, LeMahieu surged in the second half, and Chapman floundered in the second half. I think there are things that Chapman could work on to get better. Um, but again, like I, I don't feel comfortable giving him a nine-figure deal again if it was a short-term deal like two years something in that range right you know maybe an opt-out after year one I think everybody would be on board with that because it's like you can't go wrong it's a one-year it's a one-year try it deal but that doesn't look like what he's going to end up getting and quite honest like being honest with you the Giants are just such a perfect fit for him this just screams Scott Boris trying to get leverage of course they're going to mention the Yankees of course they're going to mention the Blue Jays. Of course they're going to mention all these other teams when the only team that's seriously interested is a guy, are, are the San Francisco Giants. I don't mean to draw parallels to the Yankee situations, but this screams like Scott Boris trying to drum up interest from like the Baltimore Orioles and Carlos Rodon, or, you know, uh, the Padres trying to draw up interest from like the, the Blue Jays and Juan Soto. It was clear the Yankees were going to get Rodon. It was clear the Yankees were going to get Soto. It was just a matter of when, not if. And this for me feels like a matter of when, not if for Matt Chapman to go to the Giants. So maybe I'm, you know, incorrect and maybe you feel differently, Alex. But to me, this just reads as a leverage play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, 
when you look at the need for the Yankees, it's really not at third base. Um, you have DJ LeMahieu there, really solid defensive piece. The the addition of Chapman, what does that do to this infield, right? Well, it pushes Oswald Peraza out. It pushes DJ LeMahieu back into your utility role, and Peraza ends up probably having to be traded in that instance. And I think the Yankees want to use Peraza. At some point, they have to use their prospects and not just trade them away all the time. I think they're ready to include Peraza as a prominent piece, taking over DJ LeMahieu's role as that utility infielder. Of course, if Rizzo misses any time, DJ moves back to first. Peraza plays third. So, you know, I, I do think that Chapman, while a tremendous defensive player, has really solid offensive upside. He's very streaky in that regard. I don't think he's necessary. I think most of us are, are thinking, you know, linking to Chapman is like, that's not where we should be going. Like, that's not where we should be spending money. If you're going to spend a, a lot of money, because he's looking for a multi-year deal, most likely he's 30 years old. He's still pretty young. Um, you know, he's looking to cash in right now. I don't think the Yankees are trying to pay a 30-year-old infielder who they don't need. Like, that's like, you know, we talk about not playing Blake's, uh, not paying Blake Snell. Like, why would you pay Matt Chapman instead? You know what I mean? Like, go get Blake Snell if you're going to pay Matt Chapman of all people. Um, and not to say he's not a good player because he has, you know, his elite measures. Like you said, he's the Hall of Very Good. He'd be, like, in the Hall of Fame in, like, Schenectady, but not Cooperstown. Um, I kind of feel like right now, like, that's kind of where I'm, I'm sitting is, like, he's – not exactly what we need. We need more starting rotation support. And, you know, I was thinking about it this morning, Ryan, and I was actually thinking about the rotation in general and how we haven't really done enough, right? We've only added Marcus Stroman. But comparably to last year, getting rid of Luis Severino, Frankie Montas, and Domingo Herman is actually, like, a lot. We, we get better from those players leaving, as awful as that is, right? We don't know what Frankie Montes is going to be coming off uh, shoulder surgery. Luis Severino was horrendous last season. I, and I, I freaking love Sevi, by the way. Hope he has a great career, um, you know, wherever he goes with the Mets now. Hopefully he bounces back. But he was terrible last year. From a general comparison, the Yankees got better because they got rid of worse players, um, not because they added good ones, because they got bad, they got rid of bad ones. Um, so, like, that's kind of where I see the improvement. I still think there's a lot needed, and the reason Blake Snell doesn't make sense right now is because while it may be beneficial for a year or two, that deal in three years, we're going to be looking at it saying, oh, why did we do that? Why are we paying $30 million to Blake Snell right now? We we have a, we still have Stanton under contract till 2028. Now we're strapped with $60 million or 50 mil in luxury tax salary for two guys who barely offer any value. That's where we're going to be sitting three years from now if we go and ink Blake Snell to a $200 plus million deal. However, if we win a championship in the next two years, Maybe I would be like, all right, you know, screw it. That's worth it. If you could guarantee me a championship right now in the next two seasons, I am signing Blake Snell right now for sure. I'll trade that. Um, but you can't. And the Yankees traditionally, those things go south really quickly. Those deals that are like the, the deals that are like that looks like a gamble always go in the wrong direction for the Yankees. The ones that are like that looks like a great a great contract. It's 50 50. But the ones you're worried about, they never end up panning out very well. So, you know, I think the Yankees doing it are the smart thing, being cautious, waiting patiently. And of course, like you said, Boras right now being like, I'm going to prop up, I'm going to use the media to my advantage, leverage all these players. The Yankees are like the obvious, this happens every season, by the way. The Yankees are connected to every single player available in free agency that is worth a damn. And 99% of them don't end up coming here, and the other, the rest of them end up going elsewhere, and the Yankees are used as leverage more often than any other team, and honestly, dude, if I'm Brian Cashman, and I'm going to Boros, I'm like, I've made you more money than you can even imagine, you know what I mean? I've made you more money by you using our brand as leverage, give us a damn break, like, stop messing with us, that's why, like, the Blake Snell situation, Cashman's like, dude, we're not buying, we're not bending the knee to you, like, we're not buying down to your demands, because you use us more than we need you, you know what I mean? So it's like... <laughs> I, I get that there's a dynamic at play here, um, but, you know, what is your take in terms of if the Yankees were actually interested in Chapman? I think we can both agree it doesn't make much sense at all. What would you do with Peraza? Because, like, that's the equation. That's the variable that I'm like, he has to be traded if, if you go out and get a guy like Chapman. Yeah, not only that, it's also like, all right, you sign Matt Chapman, you give him six years. Like, I'm not saying that he's not going to age well over the course of six years. We don't know that, but defense typically doesn't age well. Like usually you don't remain a great defender in like your mid or late thirties. And that's kind of Matt Chapman's calling card, right? Like it's not like his calling card is his bat where like you'd say, all right, if Aaron judge is no longer able to hold up as like an elite defensive corner outfielder, you just play him at DH. Cause he's like the best hitter in the world. You know what I mean? Like even Juan Soto, it's like, 
yeah, he's already slow, and that's probably not gonna, ch it's only gonna get worse as he gets older, he might be the slowest guy in baseball in 10 years, but he also might put up a 160 WRC plus his age 35 season and by the way the fact that it, 10 years from now Juan Soto will still be like 35 years old is just mind-boggling um but, but getting back to what you mentioned with like Snell versus Chapman here right six years to Blake Snell sure is that not great yeah but like what you would also say is well in the postseason I have Garrett Cole and Blake Snell right like I I'm gonna win a lot of games you know like that's you don't really feel that way with Matt Chapman, right? Like, you don't feel like, all right, I have Matt Chapman. I can, not, not that I can guarantee a winning game too, but like he can put his fingerprints on this game and, and win this game for us. You know what I mean? He's not a game changer, if you get what I'm saying. He's just a really good player. And I know that's very subjective. I know that game changer, like those are just kind of like, those are like buzzwords people throw out there. But I, I do think that the impact of an elite starting pitcher uh, come postseason time, and, and that's what this move would be, because I think we already know the Yankees are probably going to make the postseason, um, and that they're projected to make the postseason, and they're likely to, and it would take a collapse and something horrible happening like last year, except this team's significantly better. Like, they literally have Juan Soto and Aaron Judge. I, I would be stunned if this offense stunk. Um you have Blake Snell. Like, Blake Snell is a game changer. He he throws everything, and the rotation is rotation's a legitimate concern, right? Like, you don't know if Carl Jordan's a number two starter. I know that Blake Snell's maybe even an ace, right? Like, I, I don't even, and this is coming from somebody who wouldn't give him six years, $200 million. Like, no shot. Not even six years, $180 million. There's no shot I would do it. Um, but if you ask me, hey, the Yankees are going to make one more big move, you would pick Snell over Chapman. So, I don't think the Yankees are going to get Matt Chapman. Like, I would be stunned if they got Matt Chapman because I would be stunned if he took anything less of like a six-year deal I'd be stunned if the Giants didn't offer him multi-year commitment like look at what the Giants have to offer he played in Oakland his whole career where's San Francisco right around there right in that Bay Area kind of place he's familiar there he that's that's a that's a comfortable spot for him you know if you look at where he grew up he grew up in Fullerton California you know what I mean the guy the guy's comfortable out there like that's that's his comfort zone um you know looking at even the uh manager right they have Bob Melvin who was Matt Chapman's manager in Oakland Bob Melvin, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm like they have so much to offer. Like, if he doesn't, if he doesn't want to play for the San Francisco Giants, man, I, I'd be stunned. Like, nothing, nothing would indicate he doesn't want to go there. Nothing would. Like, I'm surprised it's taking this long. Personally, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm shocked he's still a free agent. I think that 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 Boris is trying to just say, Giants. Please just give us a little bit more. You know, we'll 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 draw up interest from in the Yankees, and they can't really use the play of we'll take a one year deal somewhere else because I just don't think he's gonna do it, right? And in Blake Snell's case, he also is not gonna take a short term deal, most likely. I've said this a million times, Alex. How are you gonna rebuild your value even more when you just won the NL Cy Young? Like, dude, I like if I'm Blake Snell, I'm like, man. I just won the a the NL Cy Young. I just led the league in ERA. Somebody's gotta pay me. I mean, now will it be a team that can win? Probably not. Like, sorry to Blake Snell, but the only other team that seems to be really interested is the Angels. And uh, I pray for your soul. Like, you basically, Blake Snell's never ring in his career. If he signs a six-year deal there, he will be one of the better pitchers to never win a World Series. Um, and you can guarantee that. At least he can, you know, feature on some list of, like, best baseball players in the 2000s to not win a World Series or something like that. I don't fucking know. Uh, but getting back to the main point here, yeah, they would need to trade Peraza. I don't, I just don't think it makes sense. Like, I think he could agree. It just, like... It feels like just, the, like, it, the, the Blue Jays, that makes sense. That's the incumbent team. The Giants, they're super interested. They can use third base help. The Yankees could use some third base help, but it's like, they love LeMayhew. Boone's been like, yeah, I want to hit him the first. And Judge is like, yeah, you should hit DJ first. Like, they wouldn't be propping this guy up if they didn't think he was good enough, right? And it's not like they're horrendous there. DJ Lee is like an average player. Now, the Blue Jays have IKF at third base, so maybe they need him a little bit more. But um, end of the day, like, the Giants, the Yankees are not giving him 100-something million dollars, and I think we'll all be okay with the Yankees not giving Matt Chapman a six-year, $120 million deal. Yeah, I mean, look, this is one of those examples of, like, the Yankees should not spend money just to spend money. That's what Chapman really is, just throwing money to throw money, and they haven't done it yet on a pitcher, and they need pitching more than infield support, so I don't think they're going to be doing this. I think the interest there is total facade. Like you said, I think Boris is using the Yankees as leverage, as he normally does. Um, not really much to write home about on that one, but, you know, interesting to talk about nonetheless. Yankees are... Uh, 
you know, slowly crawling through this next couple of weeks. I think pitchers and catchers report on February 14th, if I'm not mistaken. So that's coming up in like two weeks, guys. Uh, we should get a lot more news following up on that. Aaron Judge had his gala last night for the All Rise Foundation. A um, couple of cool things. Obviously support his cause and everything he's do, he does for the community. So shout out to Judge for all the great things he does um, in New York and, you know, for everybody because – I love I love it when athletes of that magnitude, you know, pour a lot back into uh, the community, kids, you know, families that need it, whatever it might be. Um, it does mean a lot, and I think um, using your brand as, as a good example. That's why Judge is the face of this organization. That's why they paid him. That's why he has a freaking bleacher section dedicated to him. The judges quarters, you know, he does the right thing. He is the right guy, um, and, and and I respect him for that. So good job on Judgey. Hopefully, the next couple of weeks are a little bit more informative in terms of news and things to talk about. It's kind of getting a little bit into the dead of winter now, uh, but we're, we're, we're definitely scrounging up some ideas for you guys. Hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe as always, and we'll catch you guys on the next Fireside Yankees episode.